All right, this is going to be the video for CCNA4, Chapter 3, um, Branch Connections. In this video, we're going to discuss remote access connections, point-to-point uh, -point over Ethernet, uh, VPNs, GRE tunneling, and external BGP. So that's what we've got coming up. We're going to start with remote access connections. So some broadband connection options, you've got the cable system, uh, which carries radio frequency signals across the network. Um, you've got your users with their cable modem on this end. And then you have a cable modem termination system on the provider's end. This head end, uh, CMTS, is actually a router with databases for providing internet services to your to the cable subscriber so um, it's a router again over at your providers end, providing you with databases for your internet services it's typically a mix of coaxial and fiber uh, more and more fiber these days uh, the fiber ca carries the same broadband connection for internet connections uh, telephone service and streaming video uh, as the co coaxial cables would carry. All right, moving on. Uh, DSL. Um, so for DSL, you've got um, high-speed connections installed over copper wires. Remember, there is a maximum distance of about 3.39 miles between your DSL modem and the DSLAM, or your provider's equipment over here. Um, which you need to be within in order for DSL to perform optimally. You've got your DSL transceiver and the DSL AM on your provider's side. That DSL AM is going to combine ind individual DSL connections from users into one high capacity link uh, to the ISP and therefore to the internet, which you can see here. So you got your DSL AM, ISP, internet. Your advantage over cable is cable is a shared medium and DSL is not a shared medium. So other people hopping on the network is not going to affect your performance on DSL. Uh, some other broadband connections you have, multiple municipal Wi-Fi, cellular, and satellite. Uh, municipal Wi-Fi kind of has to already be set up. It's not something you set up yourself. So let's go ahead and read through that. Uh, most, municipal, most municipal Wi-Fi networks use a mesh of interconnected access, access points. Each access point is in, a, is in range and can communicate with at least two other access points. Uh, the mesh blankets a particular area with radio signals. So again, that's something that um, is set up in the area. It's not something that you as a user go in to set up yourself or anything like that. Okay, um, cellular mobile. Uh, mobile phones use radio waves to communicate through the through nearby cell towers. Um, it consists of various standards. We went from 3G to 4G LTE. We had WiMAX that was around for a while. Um, we also have 5G, which is coming out very shortly. If not, I think it's out in a couple places already. Um, but if not, it's, it's coming soon. It's definitely coming soon. Um, satellite Internet, where... Other solutions are not viable. Satellite may be the only way to go. Um, it is not the most desirable. It's, it's affected by weather. Um, it's affected by really multiple types of, of interference. So it, it's a kind of a last resort to get satellite internet. But for where it says where internet services um, they're using lo locations where internet access is not available typically. So, um, again, that's kind of a last resort that you'd go to. So each broadband solution has its advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the factors include cable being shared by many users. Um, upstream, upstream rates are often slow during high usage hours. Um, upstream rates are usually slower than down load weight, uh, downstream or download rates uh, in general. Uh, DSL could be either way with the upload and download. If you're doing asynchronous DSL, then your upload is going to be slower. 
um, if you're doing synchronous DSL, then that would want to be the same rate. So um, depends on what type you're using. You can see the upstream rate is proportionally quite small to the downstream rate listed there in the bullet point uh, because most people do have asynchronous DSL, but there is also synchronous DSL that keeps them that uh, uh, keeps them about the same rate. Um, fiber to the home requires fiber installation directly to the home. Um, you may notice when you try to get Verizon fiber line, you either can or cannot get it because the fiber has either been laid to get to you or the fiber hasn't. Um, I've in fact heard of places being paid not to allow fiber in um, by cable car uh, companies. So uh, that's something I've also heard of that happens. Uh, cellular co coverage, uh, cellular, or cellular or mobile coverage is often an issue, even within a small office, home office. Uh, bandwidth is relatively limited. Can be. I mean, 4G LTE is is pretty dang fast, actually. So. Um, <clears throat> that might be a bit of a dated statement. Still, you do want to have a hard line just for consistency if you're trying to run a company off a of cellular. Uh, probably not the best idea. Um, Wi-Fi mesh, that's the municipal Wi-Fi that we talked about. Most municipalities do not have a mesh network deployed. If it is available and the Soho is in range, it's a viable option. Um, and Satellite is expensive, limited capacity, often provides access where no other access is possible. So that's your last resort. You can't get internet at all. Some internet, even if it's horrible internet, is better than no internet. So that's where satellite comes into play. All right, spanning tree protocols we'll take a look at. Uh, first one being point-to-point -point over Ethernet. So point-to-point, -point, um, just a point-to-point -point overview, can be used on all serial links, including those created with dial-up, uh, analog, and ISDN modems. Uh, the PPPPP, or point-to-point, -point, uh, supports the ability to assign IP addresses to remote ends of the point-to-point -point link, uh, supports chat, supports PAP, um, but Ethernet links do not natively support point-to-point. Um, point to point over Ethernet is a solution to that. Uh, creates a tunnel over the Ethernet connection. So, uh, what basically is going to happen is you need to configure your router for uh, point to point over Ethernet. Uh, it's going to send that point to point over Ethernet packet to your modem. Your modem's going to strip the Ethernet header off of it, send it over to um, the other modem. Or the modem will re-add it, send it on to the other router, and um, that's how the connection is going to be made. So you're kind of packaging point to point to be sent over the Ethernet, over Ethernet. And there is going to be some commands we need to um, input in order to make that happen. So that is the configuration order. I'm going to go ahead and have us look at that um, on a little bit better example here. All right, first we're going to create this dialer interface, uh, which is used for point to point over Ethernet. So, again, this is because we're not using a serial link, we're using an Ethernet link. Um, so, we've got um, interface dialer, some number, in this case, they use two, um, encapsulation, PPP, uh, point to point, IP address nego negotiated. They've got the same. Um, PP, uh, triple P or point to point chap that we'd used before, host name something, password something else. Okay. The ISP router is going to be set up for your username as Fred, your password as Barney. <laughs> and uh, so it's going to be able to recognize this uh, host name and password that you put in. So uh, remember from configuring point to point. In the previous chapter, that the router would have to be set up with that username and password on the ISP's side in order for this to work. Okay. We take the maximum transmission unit down to 1492 from the default of 1500 in order to accommodate for your um, 
PPOE headers. And you're going to create a dialer pool here, which is going to be the way that this dialer is connected with or linked with the interface that you want to place the dialer on. So if you're going to a gigabit Ethernet interface or fast Ethernet interface, whatever it is, this dialer pool number is going to need to match from here to down here. Okay. Also, one other thing, this IP address negotiated uh, is because the uh, internet service provider is probably going to be providing you with that IP address. It's not an IP address that you're setting up yourself, so that's why you have the IP address negotiated. It doesn't necessarily have to be that, but in most situations, it would be. Okay. In your labs in class, you may have to type in a specific IP address. I'm not sure. Okay. Anyways, uh, we get done all this okay no shutdown bring up the dialer interface uh, go to the interface you're going to place the dialer on no IP address okay similar to when we were doing multi-link uh, with point-to-point point-to-point uh, -point over Ethernet enabled point-to-point -point over Ethernet client dial pool number one okay dial pool number one I know that's a lot to remember, um, but I know with the dashes and whatnot, but remember in the CCNA, you can use your tab command, so use that tab command to your advantage. You can't use the question mark, but you can use the tab. Um, then no shutdown down here, and you're set up. All right, so back to the slide. We did the created the dialer interface with some number. We did the ch uh, chap authentication. Um, we did the PPOE enable on the interface. We made sure the dialer pool numbers matched from when we created the dialer, and we assigned the pool to the interface. Okay. Um, we took that tran uh, maximum transmission unit down from 1492 to 1500, and so we were good to go there. Uh, your verification, you've got show IP interface brief, you've got show interface dialer, and you've got show uh, PPOE sessions. We're going to take a look at those. So we've got our show IP interface brief. There's our dialer there. IP address, is it okay? Yes. Method IPCP, blah, blah, blah. Status up, up. Uh, your show interface dialer, you can see your MTU size. Uh, your encapsulation is point to point. Um, your show IP route, your dialer will show up there. Okay. And your show PPOE session. So you're seeing the remote MAC address and local MAC address of each router involved. If you want to verify that on the routers themselves, you can do a show interfaces command on each router to verify. Um, and so to troubleshoot, you've got your debug, uh, debug just like we did with point-to-point. -point. Um, you can do your debug, point-to-point -point negotiation. Um, You've got the sh whoops. You've got the show interface dialer command. Uh, if you want to verify your MTU size, make sure that's what it needs to be. And you can run into issues uh, with, with some sessions because we have decreased the maximum transport unit unit or MTU. We've decreased it from 1500 to 1492. Um, so without getting too far into it, what you can do is use this command. And if your maximum transport unit, your MTU was 1500, uh, this MSS would normally be 1460. Since we've decreased the MTU by eight, we'd actually have to decrease this by eight as well. So you'd go in, type in IP TCP adjust MSS 1452, and that should prevent you from having issues. Okay. We can also take a look at the, the debug readout that you'll see as well. Uh, the more the main points of failure is going to be that are going to be that you get no response from your ISP. Uh, your link control protocol is not open. There's an authentication failure, or your IP 
control for protocol has a failure. So you're going to check for all those things here. Okay. And you can see, hopefully you see those. I'm going to move right along here. All right. Two VPNs. All right. Next section is on VPNs. All right, VPNs are used to create any end-to-end -end, end -end private network connection over third-party networks such as the internet. Um, used to, they used to not use encryption, but now they do. Um, today, a secure implementation of VPN with encryption such as IPsec is what usually is meant by VPNing. Um, GRE is a somewhat of an example of the early versions of VPNs, but now we have encryption. Um, in order to make sure that our virtual private networking is completely secure or as secure as it can be. Uh, to implement VPNs, a VPN gateway is necessary. That could be a router, a firewall, or a Cisco adaptive security appliance. Okay, benefits, uh, cost savings, scalability, uh, compatibility with broadband technology, security, you can have people working from home more. You can uh, expand to other offices and have people um, give, give other workers access to your main corporate office or your main site. And again, it's compatible with broadband technology and it is secure. We don't really get into IPsec in CCNA anymore as much. Um, but I believe that topic is pushed to the CCNP section. So you will see that come up at some point. So we've got a couple, of, whoops, so we've got a couple different types of VPNs. We've got site to site, uh, connecting an entire, connecting entire networks to each other. Uh, they can connect a branch office to the company headquarters. Um, the site-to-site uh, -site VPNs created when devices on both sides of the VPN connection are aware of the VPN configuration in advance. Uh, the VPN remains static and an internal host have no, all it, no knowledge that the VPN exists. In a site-to-site -site VPN, end hosts send and receive normal uh, IP traffic through the VPN gateway. And the VPN gateway is responsible for encapsulating and encrypting outbound traffic for all traffic from a particular site. The VPN gateway then sends it through the VPN tunnel over the internet to a peer VPN gateway at the target site. Upon receipt, the peer VPN gateway strips the headers, decrypts the content, and relays the packet toward the target host inside the private network. Oops, this keeps on moving on me. Um, going back. Uh, remote access. So remote access VPNs are used to connect individual hosts that must access their company securely over the internet. That's typically done over a broadband connection. Uh, you're going to have some type of client software installed on your. Um, individual device out here to connect to that VPN. Uh, but that's just in some situations. You can use a Windows VPN. Um, you've got VPNing that can be done through Soho routers. So um, either going to be there's going to be some type of software somewhere, whether it's on your computer, on your router, wherever. DMVPN or Dynamic Multipoint VPN is a Cisco software solution uh, for building multiple VPNs in an easy, dynamic, and scalable manner. The goal of this is to simplify the configuration while easily and flexibly connecting central office sites to, with branch sites. This is also called a hub and spoke type VPN. This type of VPNing is built using NextHop Resolution Protocol, or NHRP, uh, multi-point generic routing encapsulation, or MGRE tunnels, uh, and IPsec encryption. All right, this next section is going to be on GRE, um, which is generic routing encapsulation. 
Um, it's an example of a basic non-secure site-to-site VPN tunneling protocol. GRE is a tunneling pro protocol developed by Cisco that can encapsulate, encapsulate a wide variety of protocol types inside IP tunnels. Uh, GRE, GRE creates a virtual point-to-point -point link to Cisco routers at remote points over an IP internetwork. So it is designed to manage the transportation of multi-protocol um, and IP traffic between two or more sites that may only have IP connectivity. So the characteristics, um, it, IP tunneling uses GRE Using GRE enables network expansion across a single protocol backbone, so you can have multiple protocols going across this single protocol backbone from site to site, um, which is the advantage of, of GRE. So in order to carry these different protocol types across the um, GRE tunnel, you have this protocol type field which will indicate which protocol, any layer 3 protocol, which is in use. Okay, so that's what this prototype, protocol type field is. GRE is itself stateless. It doesn't have any flow control mechanisms. It does not concern, uh, include any strong security mechanisms to protect the payload. Oops, and well, there we go. And the GRE header um, creates an additional um, 24 bytes at least of overhead for the tunneled packets. So that's something to consider as well. So these are the steps to configure the GRE tunnel. Um, when you set up a GRE tunnel, you're basically going to set up your own private IP address to associate with your GRE tunnel. It's not going to be the, the address of any interface on your device or anything of that nature. Um, you'll see where the inter interface addresses come in. Basically, the source and destination IP address are going to be your interface addresses. Okay, um, so each side of your GRE tunnel will have a different private IP address that you assign to it that has nothing to do with an interface on your device. So let's take a look at that. All right, so here's the steps. You're going to create that tunnel. So interface tunnel zero or tunnel whatever number you're going to make it. Uh, total mode, tunnel mode, GRE IP. Okay, we're on router one, remember. So we're going to create, and it doesn't have to be this address. It could be a 192.168.1131, whatever it is you want to make it. Um, but we're going to give some private IP address to this tunnel. Um, so we give it IP address 192.168.21, in this case, with the subnet mask. Okay. Tunnel source is going to be the source interface address for that tunnel. So I'm on R1. My source interface address is this for S000. Okay. Destination, this guy over here. All right. Um, we're going to turn on OSPF, and we're going to advertise this network that we set up through the tunnel, 192.168.20, with our wildcard mask here, area zero. And we have the tunnel set up and advertised through those commands. We flip over to R2. You're going to see as I switch the, the graphic that R2 is not going to look really any different except for the source and destination IP address is going to change. So there we go. IP address changes to 2.2. And the source and destination change because we are on R2. That should be the source. That should be the destination. And that's exactly what it is. All right, so we went through all these commands: source, destination, send IP address. We did do the option. We did not do the optional command, um, but you really will have to since uh, GRE tunnel mode is the default tunnel mode. So how do we verify? We'll go ahead and take a look at another slide. We've got a show IP interface brief, which will show you the tunnel that you've created its IP address. Um, if you go show interface tunnel zero in this case. Um, it'll show you that the protocol is up, the address of that tunnel itself, and then the tunnel source and destination. Uh, you can also see that the protocol is GRE IP. 
Okay, so that's again show interface tunnel zero, show IP interface brief. Remember, I think I've stated in multiple videos that your show commands are going to be quite important in your testing. Quite important in real life, because, I mean, once your networks are set up, you're just troubleshooting once things go wrong. So, definitely want to know those. Uh, to verify OSPF adjacency via GRE tunnel, you've got your normal show IP OSPF neighbor. You can see interface tunnel 0, neighbor ID, address, so on and so forth. All right, our troubleshooting commands, we got show IP interface brief. Uh, to verify that the tunnel interface is up and configured with the correct IP address uh, for the physical interface and the tunnel interface. You'll see both of those there. Um, show IP OSPF neighbor. Uh, show IP route. We'll take a look at those. All right, so we've got our show IP interface briefs. So you can see that your uh, interface is up and running, correct IP address. Your tunnel is up and running, correct IP address. Um, your show IP interface brief on R2, same thing. Okay. <clears throat> show IP route OSPF. To verify that uh, your network is being passed between the two routers, it is through SPF, so you're good to go there. Okay. And that's going to be about it for GRE. And we move on to BGP, last section of this chapter. So here we go. So we've got internal gateway protocols, uh, interior, I'm sorry, interior gateway pro protocols, um, which is what we've been discussing, EIGRP, OSPF, RIP, um, all internal gateway, interior <laughs> gateway protocols. Our exterior gateway protocols is the only one we're going to learn in this course. Um, if you go on to CCNMP, you'll learn a couple more, but uh, EGP is the only one we're going to use. Okay, and those uh, exterior gateway protocols or for the exchange of routing information between autonomous systems. These autonomous systems are going to be different from the autonomous systems we work with with EIGRP in that in EIGRP we just make up the entire uh, ent the autonomous system. Um, in BGP or in exterior gateway protocols, the autonomous system is assigned to you. You can't change it. Okay, so that's something to to remember. Uh, when to use BGP? Uh, BGP is most appropriate when an autonomous system has connections to multiple autonomous systems. Um, that is known as multi-homed. Uh, each autonomous system um, that is multi-homed basically has at least two other autonomous systems connected to it or as peers. Okay, so that's what makes you multi-home. A multi-honed at least two other autonomous systems connected to your autonomous system. BGP should not be used when it's a single connection or single homed. Okay, just one route. All right, you could just have a static route there, uh, or there is a limited understanding, I guess, of BGP. Yeah, you probably don't want to implement it unless you understand it. That's should go without saying, I think. I guess uh, that should be emphasized, though, because if you mess up BGP, you could have negative effects on the entire internet. If you somehow change your autonomous system and the internet expects you to be a certain autonomous system number and you're not, that can have really bad effects on, yes, the internet in general, so throughout the internet. Options. There are three common ways an organization can use, choose to implement uh, BGP in a multi-homed environment. So your default route only is the simplest, um, but it is only a default route. So if you have default routes to do two different locations, that means your traffic could go to one location or the other, um, which means you don't know what the cost is going to be to get to a certain network. You may want to take one route over another to get to uh, another autonomous system quickest, but you're your devices don't know that. 
all they have is a default route saying for any traffic go this way so there's no decision making basically going on that's why it says suboptimal routing may occur if you have this default route only setup default route and isp is going to take that and improve upon it um, you still have your default route set up but your um, isp is also going to advertise its own network. So if it's a network advertised by the ISP, um, you'll know which direction to go to to get it to that network most optimally. But if it's not, you're still going to take either one of those two default routes. So um, some suboptimal suboptimal routing may occur if you're trying to get trying to get to a network that is not advertised by your ISP. So you still have some suboptimal routing going on here. And the bottom one is going to have the most overhead or produce the most overhead on your router, tax your router the most, um, because now you're going to receive all internet routes from any um, ISP routers that you're connected to. Okay. Um, but what that's going to mean is that your router is going to need all routes, all internet routes contained on it. So your router better be up to the task um, if that's going to be your situation. So there may be some cons uh, consideration as to what type of device you're using as to how you would set up your BGP, whether you want to use all routes, default route and ISP routes, or default route only. All right, configuring BGP is going to be uh, step one, enabling, step two, configuring your neighbors, and step three, advertising your networks um, originating from this autonomous system. So let's take a look at how that's going to look in action. All right, so here we are. We're going to configure the router with BGP with the router BGP and your autonomous system number, uh, which in this case for router the company A router is 65,000. Um, then you've got your neighbor's address, which is a 0 .1, 209, .1 up here. And the remote autonomous system number, which is 65,001, just right there. Okay, that's where the 65,000 came from, is up there. Okay, um, then you're going to uh, advertise the network within your autonomous system. So if you got 198.133.219.0, here it is. You can do mask, and then that, let me double check. I think you can do wildcard or mask, but I guess mask is easiest just to type in mask and put in a normal subnet mask there. Okay, um, and for the ISP router, it's going to be same type of thing. It's autonomous system number, BGP, router BGP, it's autonomous system number, the neighbor's address here, um, remote autonomous system 65,000, and it's just going to set up a default route, network 0000, everything is going to go that direction. Okay. For verifying VGP, we got show IP route, show IP BGP, uh, show IP BGP summary. Um, you can see what they do, verifies uh, advert routes advertised by BGP, the, the BGP neighbor, um, verifies that they're in the routing table, uh, verify that received and advertised IP4 networks are in the BGP table, and uh, verify that IP4, IPv4 BGP neighbors and other BGP information. Okay, so let's take a look at that real quick. Show IP route. We're on company A showing IP route. We can see that default route to um, the ISP router. Okay, 000 via blah. So that's set up and you see a B for BGP versus the other letters that we'd have up here for our other protocols. Uh, show IP BGP. Again, we're on the company A router. We're going to see the networks that we know about through BGP, the next hop, and the network that we're advertising. Okay, so we can verify both of those things that we have entered in BGP, the one we know about through BGP, and the network we're advertising through BGP. And then we have 
show IP BGP summary, um, which is going to show our router's BGP information in terms of our address, our autonomous system number, and our neighbor's information, our neighbors down here, autonomous system number, blah. So you can verify that as well. I think that is it for that. That is. Let me get this out of the way. Okay. And down here, those are the things we just saw. Show IP route. Show IP BGP. Show IP BGP summary. Okay. And that is going to be it for BGP. All right. So that's two videos down. Hopefully within the next two weeks, I'll get the rest of Chapter 8 done. All right. So, um... Maybe later on this week we'll do chapter four.